Most of you, if not all of you, have seen and heard Dr. Don McClure, longtime and popular missionary to Africa. First went there in 1928, and Don, I don't think you can imagine that uh, 40 long years have passed since you first set foot on that dark continent. But God has mightily used this man, one of the most interesting men I have ever met anywhere in all my life. Don, come on up and speak to us. Well, let's get located, first of all. I've been living uh, way up in the upper reaches of the Nile River Basin in the South Sudan and Western Ethiopia. It's in Plains country, a country just as flat as this floor, and uh, the grass grows up there 10, 12, 15 feet high, the elephant grass. And uh, then we have scrub bush and timber, but not heavy jungles like they have in the Congo. We're not in the actual jungle belt and the rain belt. So uh, that's the type of country. We live up there among 25,000 people the only white men in the whole area among all these people, and we've had a wonderful time. They're very cordial people, very much interested in us, and uh, easy to work with. Well, we have to make our own way up there. We have one steamer comes in, a uh, steamer comes in once a year during the month of July and August. Uh, perhaps uh, two or three steamers will come, but that's our steamer season. Bringing in our supplies for the year, our nearest butcher shop is 800 miles away, and if we want a hamburger, we have to go out and slice it off an antelope. We run a clinic there. And this clinic, during the last 18 months, we have had more than 19,000 patients. Uh, occasionally amputations. We had a woman came in who, a woman came into the clinic uh, two years ago, I guess it was now. She had stepped down into the river to have a bath, and a, a crocodile came up and grabbed her by the leg. And when it threw her into the water, she managed to catch hold of a root out on the bank. And she hung on to that root, and the old crocodile chewed away at her leg. And when a crocodile gets a hold of something like that, he just throws himself over and over and over, just rolls around in the water. And she hung on when that crocodile just twisted that leg up. It had broken both bones and, of course, uh, shredded the flesh in part, but it just twisted that leg up. And that woman had the guts to hang on to that root uh, through all of it, screaming for the men in the village, and they came rushing down with their spears and, and drove the crocodile away, but uh, she had a horrible leg. Ten days later, they brought that woman into the clinic. She lived about 30 miles away, and they had to bring her in by boat. She was only semi-conscious. And, uh, well, I took this plaster off, and such a mess I never saw in my life. Just a few tendons holding the, that leg on. All the other flesh rotted away. And... Uh, the upper part of the leg was in pretty good shape, but the lower, the, the foot and the lower part was just a mass of rotten flesh. Well, it's, uh, there's nothing to do but amputate. And, well, what do you do like that when you're not a doctor? <laughs> well, I had a chart or two showing how to make amputations, and I followed these charts, and uh, we cut her leg off about three inches below the knee where we found some good flesh and made a flap over the wound and sewed her up. And three months later, she was walking around on a peg leg, which we had whittled for out of a fence, fence post. And she today praises the Lord that she lost her leg because she said if she hadn't lost her leg, she never would have come to learn Christ, never would have become a Christian. Remember in days past, I've always shared with you some adventure experiences, hunt big game hunting and things of that kind. But you know, I found that there's more adventure in just waiting for the Lord to do things in Africa than I have ever had in hunting big game. I've gotten more thrills in the last three months than ever before in my experience in Africa. And it's this that I want to share with you. Because in working with the Lord, you do stick your neck out, and you have some real experiences if you're willing to go the whole way with him. 
In the years past, I've talked to you something about our ANUAC project work and how we were trying to reach a single tribe of people of about 40,000 people in a limited period of time. In November, we had a evaluation conference to try to find out how far we had gone, what we had done with this ANUAC project, and we realized for the first time that our task was accomplished. We had been in every village, we had preached the gospel to every single one of the 40,000 people, and we had 25,000 of the 40,000 who would be in worship service in any given Sunday. We had trained them for Christian living. We had trained teachers, we had trained evangelists, agriculturalists, and uh, public health men. And they were ready to take over. spoke to me words out there which burned themselves into my heart and which I'll never forget one day. As I was going out into this village, a man met me and begged me to go and give this girl medicine. <clears throat> I learned that the village was 20 miles away, and well, I said, I can't go that far to your village, 20 miles, and I have all this work here at the mission to do, and I have a hundred people in the clinic, and I have a house to build, and school to teach, and one thing and another, I just can't go. And he begged me to go, and he said, my, my daughter's dying. Unless you go, she'll, she'll die. Well, I made inquiries as to what her trouble was, and well, he said, she's cursed. And I said, where? Because if you localize the curse, sometimes you can give the medicine that may suit the need, if it's in the head or in the chest or in the abdomen. Oh, she said she's been cursed all, he said she's been cursed all over. Well, what kind of medicine would you give in a case like that? You know what I gave him? I gave him aspirin tablets and sent him back to his village to treat that dying girl. And those aspirin tablets became symbolic in my life of the thing that America is doing today to a dying world. Christian friends, we're feeding a dying world aspirin tablets, not because it'll do the world any good, but because it's a palliative to our own souls. It gives us a feeling that we're doing something, a world that is dying out of Jesus Christ, we're giving them the superfluities of our lives, our dollars and the things that we don't need. We're pouring out upon a dying world. And Christian friends, it'll no more save the world than those aspirin tablets will save that dying girl. And we need to begin thinking of missions in new terms, no longer in terms of what we're doing for the world, but in terms of getting this word of God out into hearts that don't know him. And we must never cease as a Christian church, as a Christian people, to search out the last soul that doesn't know Jesus Christ. And we never can rest until we have found the last soul. The man came back the second day and I gave him more aspirin tablets and sent him out to the little girl. That's what we always do. It satisfied my heart that I was doing something. Aspirin tablets. The third day, the mother and the father came in they got down on their hands and knees and they took hold of my feet and tried to kiss my feet, begging me to go out there and see that little girl. Now, my heart will take so much. And then, almost in anger, I said to the man, well, I'll go with you, but I'll have to finish my day's work first. You wait, I'll go this evening. That evening, I took a lantern, went out across those swamps and through those forests to this little village. I didn't have to go into that house to know what the girl was dying of. Plain that she was dying of dysentery. When I went into the house, I saw her emaciated and broken, lying there on the ground. And I knew that as far as she was concerned, my visit was hopeless. But the Lord had a point in getting me out to that village. As I stooped over that dying little girl, I spoke to her, and she opened her eyes and looked up into my face, and she spoke words I'll never forget. As she said to me, Kip you carry all, Sean. Why is it you didn't come long ago? And Christian friend, a dying world is asking that question of you today. Why is it 
we haven't done something long ago. We who are Christians and who take the name of Jesus, our Savior, as Lord and Master. May the Lord bless your hearts and empower your hands as you unite hearts and hands in this great task of the evangelization of the world for him. And dear God, and our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for this great task of ours. We thank you, O Lord, that it is the hope and the purpose of life to go into all the world and gather out from among the nations the church of Jesus Christ. O Lord, inspire our hearts. Give us vision and broaden horizons of life which will continually drive us on until we have accomplished that great purpose of going into all the world to preach the gospel. For we pray in his holy name, even our Savior, Amen.